But anyway, Psalms 133. We're going right back to where we had left off the last time I was up here. Um, Psalms 133. Are you in the NASB? Okay, cool. Thank you. Psalms 133. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, well, I'll read the whole thing. It's short. But I'm only focusing on just part of the first two verses. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edges of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life, forevermore. Actually, I did need to read all three verses because the last part really summarizes the whole yes. point of this message. That's where the commandment comes, where he commands a blessing on his people. And the blessing that's on his people is because his people are connected to him. So what about God's position? In this right here, this is, this is a picture. And, and I shared some of it the last time I was up here. But in this picture, we see the head at the top, where it's supposed to be, right? And then we see oil, precious oil, not just any oil. This is precious oil. This is the oil of the Holy Spirit that was poured on his head. And the oil went down, and it went down his beard. And from his beard, it dripped down onto his garment, his robe, if you will. And it went all the way down to the very edges of his garment. And I had said last time, notice that in this picture, it's really a picture of Jesus Christ at the head. And it's a picture of his body, the body of Christ beneath. And it's a picture of how the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus and sent him out into the wilderness to be tempted. And then after that, he released him into his ministry. But the Holy Spirit went to Jesus. And then from Jesus, it went to his disciples and from his disciples, it went on out Amen. after the day of Pentecost. And so what we see here is a picture of the authority of Christ as the head. He is the decision maker. He is the finger pointer. He is the one who speaks. And when he speaks, we listen. Yeah, we right. do what he says, right? If we're true children of God, if we're soldiers in his, in his army, right? right? And so what happens is it goes down to the beard and the beard is wisdom. It represents the wisdom of Christ. It's maturity. No boy is going to have a beard, right? And so this shows maturity and the wisdom of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was on that wisdom that came directly from the head and down to the garments. But the oil never touched the flesh because we have to put on robes of salvation, garments of righteousness. Isaiah talks about it. Isaiah talks about it in uh, chapter 61, verse 10. He says, talks about being clothed with garments of salvation and covered with a robe of righteousness or, or wrapped. It could also say in another place, wrapped with a robe of righteousness. So that oil, it doesn't touch flesh because when God uses the oil of the Holy Spirit, when he uses the God, the Holy Spirit in our life, it's through the righteousness of God. It's through Christ. And when he did at the cross, that we have his righteousness and then he can have his Holy Spirit touch our life. Amen. But it, he doesn't use our carnal, fleshly right. state. He can't use that. He won't use it. The reason he won't use it because he can't use it. He can't use it because he won't. And he's holy. It's the nature of God. It's his nature. Amen. It's who he is. He, he won't function any other way. You know, I could try to come up with some weak example, but what weak example is going to really illustrate that? God is God. It's his nature. You know what I mean? Every beast of the field, the birds and the fowls of the air, they have their nature, right? There's certain things that they do. And, and that's why they do what they do. They can't do anything different. And so in God and in Christ, he does what he does. He's holy and he has requirements and he's not going to violate his own nature. And that's the way it is. So his position, God's position, he's the head. The head is the owner and the head who is the owner is God. And so what he says, we, we listen to it and, and he's redeemed us. Isaiah 43 says in, in, in verse one, he says that I redeemed you and you are mine. 
You are mine. And then down in verse 21, he says that I formed you for myself. You're my, he's saying it again. You're mine. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he says that you're not your own. You were bought with a price. So they're both saying the same thing. Isaiah said you were redeemed. That means you were bought, right? Yeah. For what purpose? Because to be mine. And then that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Why? Because you're not your own. Well, whose are you? You're mine. Yeah. That's what he's saying. The same uh, blessing that he put upon the people of Israel and Abraham and his, his, his children, he gave to us. We're the Gentiles. We're the wild olive branch that was grafted into the olive tree. And so we are a part of that. And that's what he's letting us know in 1 Corinthians 6. So what about God's position? God's position, he says in John 10, 14, I know my own. He's talking, the shepherd's talking about his sheep. He says, I know my own and my own know me. He's saying you're mine. He's saying you're not your own. He says you're my own. You're my own and my own knows me because you don't belong to yourself. You don't do what you want when you want. You get irritated. You can't just do what you want. Come on. Because remember, the oil doesn't touch flesh. The oil only touches the garments. And that's the only thing he uses. He only uses the righteousness that came through Calvary, through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that he can work through. That's the only thing he's ever going to work through. And so we, that's why we have to understand and we have to stay connected to the message of the cross. We have to keep our roots and our foundation in what Christ did there. And then from that, we can function as a body with gifts. Gifts are given to men and women. Fruit is grown. It's very different. It's very different, right? The purposes are not the same. God can use, God does use both of them. God does use both of them. So that's what it is about God's position. But what about God's people? That's us, the body of Christ. Isaiah 61, 10, I already told you that uh, we're clothed with garments of salvation and covered or wrapped with robes of righteousness. Romans 12, 3 says that we should not think of ourselves more highly the King James actually says, but rather think soberly. I, I love the way the King James says it because I, I, we're drunk on ourselves sometimes. That's really what it is. We're just so full of ourselves. It's like we're drunk on it. And that's the only way. I, there was a point in my Christian walk where I realized, like, I really could recognize man, I am so in the flesh right now before I even opened my mouth. And, and reacted on it. You know what I mean? Really acted on yeah. it. I could sense, I could sense that fire, that flame. I could sense the carnal nature just really wanting to take over. And, and when I got the revelation and, and God, you know, really showed me, man, that is the flesh. That is garbage. It's trash. That's what I can never use. That's what will always get in the way of what I want to do. Right. And when I got that revelation, I, I would love to be able to say I never really had a big struggle with it again. But it was the same day I had another struggle with it again. And the thing is, it was from that point going forward through that, that understanding that I was able to remember that, okay, the default position is Christ mm -hmm. crucified, right? That's the default position. And so if I can recognize when it's, when it's happening... Default back. Go to the cross. Get right. Get washed. Get cleansed. Amen. And don't let that thing grow. That's the works of the flesh. He wants right. the fruit. He wants the fruit to grow. Praise God. Good word. Bro. So he doesn't want us to think more highly of ourselves. And that right there directly works against the body of Christ. It works against the plan and the purpose of the head. What Jesus wants in his position as the head. What he wants is for the body of Christ to be together, to be assembled, to be one, to be one body, functioning as one body. There's no other way for the body to function. He gives us gifts individually. He's working his fruit in us individually, but for the purpose of that, we would work together as a body corporately, yeah. that we would work together as a whole. God really doesn't want us going out by ourselves purposefully, you know, ministering to people. He would love for us to have someone else with us. That's what he did when he sent his disciples. Like, you know, Wade had told me one time, he said, you know, if we end up going to the Morgan City Jail and, and you know, maybe a couple of us will go together, you know, he said, I think that's just the way to do it, you know. That's the way Jesus did it, right? He sent them out in twos. But you see what Jesus did there? 
He's demonstrating corporate. He's demonstrating body. He's demonstrating one member and another member together. Jesus did it. He didn't do anything without his father. He had the Holy Spirit's anointing on his life. He, the, the, the tri-unity of God was always together. Everywhere Jesus went, the Holy Spirit was there. He was constantly praying to his Father, and the Father was speaking to him. And so it's another picture of the body. It's another picture of unity, the unity of the Spirit, and the way that he uh, exemplified what he wants from us, what he expects from us. But if we're thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to, and we're drunk on ourselves, there's no way it's going to happen. We're not going to put anyone else above ourselves. It's really going to be centered around us. If I have a gift, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to make it about me rather than the body of Christ and ministering to, to others. You know, and I, the fruit's going to be hard to find in that scenario. I'm just going to tell you right now. Because the, like I said, the fruit is not like the gift. It, it, the gifts are very different from the fruit. The fruit is going to come out whenever I'm really in a right walk and in a right relationship with Christ. You're going to see the love and the gentleness, the kindness and all that. That's right. It's going to come out. It's just going to naturally come out. First Corinthians, where I'm going to actually read through this one. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. Why are we always talking about unity lately, I wonder? I listened to, uh, to Nye, uh, Sister Nye preach. Man, I, I was in my bathroom getting ready for bed, and uh, I just started, man, it just, I felt so much of the joy of the Lord. It was so anointed, and it was so powerful. If you didn't hear that, if you weren't here, or you didn't watch the video, you really should go watch it. It was so good, and I just started jumping up and down. I was getting all excited in, in the bathroom on the platform, I'm sure. Uh, it was just really good. And, and what excited me also is that I, I, I see, you know, that that theme right there, it's, it's, it's on a lot of people's hearts. I think people are recognizing it. If we don't see it and we don't recognize what the devil's doing and how he's attacking the unity, trying to bring division uh, amongst us and trying to pit us against one another, that if we don't recognize it, how can we respond appropriately? Amen. You know, and so uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 18. Let's see. Okay. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. Just as he desired. I like the way it reads in verse 14 at the beginning of what we read. For the body is not one member, but many. And then I love the way it ends. It says that, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. See, he's the head. He makes the decision. He distributes the gifts. He distributes the grace for those gifts. He decides who does what. He decides who can or who won't. Look, if I am not able to have a, operate right now in a gift that I want, Paul makes it very clear, right? We can eagerly desire the greater gifts. And when you dig deep into what that means, you can seek after a particular gift of the Holy Spirit, a ministry gift, whatever, a gift that God has made available to us if you want that. And, and I'll be honest with you. I'm not so sure that just playing, praying, now I lay me down to sleep every night is going to get that done. Come on. I mean, let's just be honest. Do you really want it? Like, are you really hungry for something like that? And then I believe God will respond to that in time, you know? But the main point here is that we were created to do something specific. We were created to live for God. We were created to be witnesses and to be lights in the darkness. But we were created to do something specific with our life. We were created to do something very 
uh, definitive. And, and I believe that's what he's saying. I believe that's what he's saying right there when he says it like that. The way he says, just as he desired. He's placed the members, each one of them, in the body. So looking at the body, that's what, like, he's put the pinky where it goes. He put the nose and the eyes. That's what we were, we were reading a little earlier. You know, he put them in a specific place where they belong. But notice the foot and the hand got some issues, right? The foot and the hand are kind of like working against each other. What's up with that? Okay, and then you got the eye and the nose. They're at odds with each other. You know, so he's making the point that if the foot is called to be a foot to take the body somewhere, the foot needs to do it. You don't need to be walking on your hands. I mean, they have their specific function and purpose. The foot's not going to grab, the hands are, right? And so when you look at the nose is going to smell, the eyes are going to see. But look, what if the foot and the nose have a conflict? This could get really, really confusing. Because the nose is supposed to smell, but when the feet are smelling, we've got a real problem. Right? The feet are supposed to run, but when the nose starts running, we got a problem. The nose is not supposed to run, the feet are not supposed to smell. The feet are supposed to run, the nose is supposed to smell, right? Okay, I just thought I'd lighten it up just a little bit. But um, anyway, I, I didn't know if that was going to go over. But seriously, I mean, it's a fact. It, it, it is true. What about God's people? What about God's people? We're not able to do what we're supposed to do. I'm not going to be able to do what I'm supposed to do for Christ if it's all about me. If I'm centered on myself. If I, if it's just simply that way. It's got to be about the head. It's got to be about Christ. Amen. It's got to be about him. It can't be about anybody else. So what is God's purpose? What is his ultimate purpose? I mean, there's so many answers that could be given. What's God's purpose? I mean, I believe that one way to say it, you know, is, is to restore man back to himself. Yes. God wants a relationship. Yes. He wants a, an absolute <coughs> jam up tight union with fallen man, just yes. like he had with Adam and Eve in the garden. I believe that's that's the old, that's one way we could say the ultimate purpose, what it is. And so that's why we have to have Christ and what he did at the cross in our life. That's why we have to have faith in what Jesus did. And we have to repent. And repent as many times as, as it arises that we need to repent. We need to repent. It's not something that we just do when we become born again. It's not just something that we do one time when we get saved. It's an ongoing thing. We continually keep our faith anchored in what Christ did at the cross. That's where the spiritual victory comes in our life. There is no other program. There is no other way. There is no other path to spiritual victory. That's it. 1 Corinthians 12, 25. What is God's purpose? What is God's purpose? In 1 Corinthians 12, 25, he talks about there being no division in the body. No division in the body. And that we should have the same care for one another. Amen. That there will be no division with one another. And that we should have the same care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. What's the purpose? What's God's purpose? What does he want to do with the body of Christ? What does he want to do with these powerhouse gifts that he's given to the body of Christ? He wants it to be used for the common good. Yeah. Again, it's not about self. It's, it's for the common. It's for the community. It's for the common good. The good of, of the whole body. It's not for me. It's not for me to get drunk on myself. He said, sober up. Sober up. Wake up. That's what it's supposed to be for. What's God's purpose with these gifts? What's God's purpose with the body of Christ? It's to equip the saints in Ephesians 4, 12 through 13. He's talking about the ministry gifts, the fivefold ministry, the pastor, the evangelist. I've heard it said like this, the thumb is kind of like the apostle because it can touch all the other four. It can operate and function in the other four. The, the index finger, it points the way. That's like the prophet, it points the way. The middle finger reaches out further, right? That's like the evangelist. The evangelist reaches out the furthest. And then you got this finger, right? The, the ring finger. That's the one that's married to the church. That's like the pastor. And then you got the teacher. That's the one that can get in the ear, right? <laughs> and so you got the fivefold ministry. It's the, 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 those are gifts. He said he gave gifts to men, right? And, and so he's given those gifts to us, to the body of Christ, for the purpose so that he could equip the saints. That's more of an equipping uh, set of gifts. 
Whereas the other gifts are for the community, for the building up and the edifying. And so Romans 12, 4 through 6, he talks about one and the same spirit distributes. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's the one and same spirit that distributes all of those gifts. In this passage, he's talking about the gifts that he mentions in Romans chapter 12. And these are gifts that I find um, are a little bit more neglected to be looked at and noticed. But you know what one of those gifts is? To show mercy. To show mercy. That's a gift. That's a gift. I want that gift. I really want to have the gift to show mercy. Amen. There's another gift to give. Have you known anybody that's like the most generous person you've ever met? Yeah. That gift right there is way far too unnoticed. I'm telling you, that is a powerful gift to me, help to meet needs in people. We have people in this church that have that gift. Amen? Amen. We do. That's a gift. Listen, that happens by the Holy Spirit. That happens directly from the head. That doesn't, that does not come naturally. Whether you have a lot or don't have a lot, that does not come naturally. Whether you consider yourself well off or poor, that does not come easily. That's the Holy Spirit does that and puts it in their heart to be generous and to give right. when they see a need, when they see somebody that has a need and they know they can feel it. No thought, no second thought. They do it. They meet it. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God. Amen. That's what Jesus died for, that right there. He died to have that kind of heart. That's the kind of heart that, that he died to, to, to equip and to raise up. In Praise us. God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So it's one and the same spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the same one that gives the gift to be merciful, the gift of prophecy, to prophesy, the gift to exhort. If you're an exhorter, he has, he's the one. He's the same one. He gives the gift to speak in tongues, to give an interpretation. It's the same one spirit. That one spirit is the same one. But listen, he, he distributes those gifts as he wills. I am keep coming back to that same point. He distributes them as he wills. It's his will. It's his purpose. He's the one who's going to do it the way he wants to do it, when he wants to do it. Amen. We can seek him for it, though. We can. Praise God. Amen. Check this out. John 3, 8. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus? He's, he's one of the Sanhedrin. You know, he's one of the high priests. He's in that, that, that group, that club. Jesus wasn't in that club. <laughs> But Nicodemus recognized something about Jesus, and it was something very special he knew, and he wanted to find out more. And so he had to go and see him at night. It would seem that you know, he didn't want to be seen with Jesus, and that's okay because he got to Jesus. And uh, Jesus met him where he was, but in the conversation, he, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus that you must be born again if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he was like, how is this possible, right? You remember the conversation? How can a man go into his mother's womb a second time? How is this possible? But notice what he said when he's explaining it. He gives him an illustration and he talks about how the wind blows as it wishes. The wind blows as it wishes. The Holy Spirit is going to distribute as he wills. The wind blows as it wishes. The wind is like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very similar to the wind. The wind just has, it does its own thing. You know, you throw something in the air on a windy day and it's like, to try to keep up. The Holy Spirit is doing his, he's doing his own thing. He is God. Okay? And he's doing what the Father has commissioned him to do. So again, the authority, the authority, it all goes back to the head and the anointing, the precious oil that comes down the head. And goes down to the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he talks about how many members do not have the same office. There are many members. There are many members, but they do not all have the same office. So in 1 Corinthians 12, he's breaking it down at the beginning. And then as he goes through it, he goes into a little more depth. And he's just trying to make the same point that was made in, in, uh, in the book of Romans chapter 12. 
We don't all have the same gift. We're not all called to do the same thing. And so the sooner that everybody, you know, everybody understands that, I'm sure some of you do. I'm not saying that, that everybody doesn't. But the sooner that the whole body understands that, you don't have one trying to do their own thing. You don't have one trying to go against the rest of the body. Everyone recognizing that, you know, this is maybe not what I'm supposed to be doing or, you know, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing, but we don't need to try to be something that we're not. We don't need to try to be something that we're not. Look, if I'm trying to be used in a certain way and God's not doing it, and I know, I know my heart is clean, my heart is pure, hey, maybe right now it's just not what God wants to do. You can't just get down in a squatting position and, and make it, you know, squat it out. It's not going to happen. The Holy Spirit has to do it. The Holy Spirit has to do it. God has to do it. Remember who's the head? Remember who's the one who distributes? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God. He distributes. He decides. The head always makes a decision. The tail wags. The tail passes poop. That's what the tail does. We're more like that. You know what I'm saying? We just do what the head tells us to do. Right? Yeah. I want... <laughs> anyway, I'm going to let that go. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14, 32. Check this out. This is one that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So you, you could have one of those situations where the Holy Spirit is really moving on somebody and they could be completely out of order. Completely out of order with the flow of what's already happening. And I believe what he's telling us here, I mean, it applies to the prophet, of course, you know, someone who has that, that calling. But the Holy Spirit is not going to try to make me or you do something that's out of order in the flow of what's or, what he's already doing. So like, let's say God gives me something and he wants me to say or he wants me, gives me something to do you know, and, and it would be out of line and it would kind of break the flow of what's already happening, I can wait. I feel overwhelmed with the power, yes. I feel overwhelmed with his presence, but I can wait. I have self-control. He, he says it right here. He says it. The spirit, so my spirit man and what I'm being ministered to, uh, you know, by the Holy Spirit, I can control that. He's given me controls there. <coughs> He's given me controls. I have a head too, you know, I have a, you know, I can think, I can think this through, there's something else going on. So, and, and the whole point is that we have to work together in unity. We are a body, we work together, we work together as one. Amen. We work together as one. This is where we get into the, the part that, um, this part here is, uh, it can be a little rough, but, Look, I, some people don't like to hear hard messages, you know, and, and I find that uh, when, I, when I was at a place where I didn't like to hear hard messages, it was because I wasn't living right and I wasn't wanting to be right, you know, but when I'm, when I'm living for the Lord and I'm wanting to do what's right, I, I love it, you know, I love it. Don't give me a Twinkie message, give me the asparagus, give me the spinach, give me the good stuff that's going to make me strong, that's going to make me grow, that's going to make me check myself. Uh, gifts, this is the point I want to make. Gifts do not always mean you are good with God. Gotcha. Gifts are not evidence that you're in a right relationship with God, that you're in right standing with God. I'm going to prove it through the scripture, so just stay with me. Um, I'm not, I don't have the verse, Chris, but it's in 1 Samuel 15, just so you know. In 1 Samuel 15, the first king of Israel was Saul. And at that point in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, Saul had been so disobedient to God. He had been so way out there that God told the prophet Samuel to go and tell Saul, tell him I have rejected him. And that's what Samuel tells him. The prophet tells him, God's rejected you, Saul. You don't listen. You don't do what he's told you to do. You've been disobedient. You've done what you wanted to do. And he, he's pretty much done with you. So the only thing that was waiting to happen was just for him to die. That was pretty much it. So from that point forward, things just continually spiraled downward. 
And so you can see in 1 Samuel chapter 19 that he gets so jealous. He had already been very jealous of David, who had already been anointed to be the, the second king, the next king after Saul was out of the throne. And so he was so jealous because he was very successful. God was using David. God's anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit was on David's life even before Samuel poured the oil and anointed him as king. He had a different anointing, but when he had the anointing oil for, to be a king, that's a different anointing God called him to. And I think that's a good illustration to show where there's a place that's either in Romans or it's in 1 Corinthians 12. It's in Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12 where he... He talks about according to the grace that's given. When you have a gift, it's according to the grace that's given to you. And so with David, there was grace that was already given to him. He was already an anointed young man. Man, he slew the bear, the lion. He took him out by the power of God. He took out Goliath. And, and God used him as a deliverer and a savior, so to speak, for the whole nation to deliver them from the hand of Goliath and the Philistines. And that, that was an anointing. He had a warrior's anointing on his life. But then Samuel, when God sent him to go and look at all of Jesse's sons, who was, Jesse was David's dad, and, and he, went, he went through the line, and finally he got down to David, and then he said, that's the one. That is the one. And that oil that was poured on his head, that was an anointing that was put upon him to be the next king. Something very different. Something very different. But Saul, back to King Saul, he was rejected. God told him that he was rejected as king of Israel. And then later on in 1 Samuel chapter 19, Saul is so jealous and he's so angry with David. And he just wants him dead. He had already tried to kill him. He had already tried to take him out. And he couldn't succeed because the anointing of the Holy Spirit was on David. God had a plan for David. David was obedient. David was obedient, and so that brought protection to David's life. And so what ended up happening was Saul sent some messengers to go and to kill David, or to grab him and bring him to him. That's actually how, but his intent was to kill him in the end. So what happens? They go, and they get to where David is. David's with Samuel, the prophet, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is so strong that the power of God comes on those messengers that are going to get David to get him killed with Saul. And they begin to prophesy. You think these guys were right with God? They were going to get the man that God anointed to bring him to the king so that he could be put to death. So Saul finds out word, gets back to King Saul, and he's like, oh, that didn't go well. That's not, uh, if y'all can't get it done, we'll send somebody else. So he sends another set of messengers. What do you think happened? The same thing happens a second time. The Holy Spirit comes on these men who are not right with God, not living for the Lord, not doing God's purpose, and they begin to prophesy. Then word gets back to King Saul. He does the same thing a third time. He sends a third set of messengers to go. The same thing happened again. They begin to prophesy. <laughs> And then after that, he's like, well, I got to go now. This is a job for the king, the king that God rejected. So he goes over there and he tries to do the same thing. The Holy Spirit comes on him and he begins to prophesy. And he takes it to another level. I don't want to get into all that. But the point is this. The gifts, the gifts do not mean that I'm okay with God. They do not prove that. Now, it means that the Spirit of God is on me and using me. And I'm sure that he used the prophecies that they were giving out for, for a good reason. He used it for his purposes. So what I'm saying is that we need to have a level of focus on the fruit of the Holy Spirit to make sure that we are good with God. God. Because if you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit That's flowing right. through your life, right. you're good with God. That's right. If you have that love and that peace and that joy and that self... self yeah. I mean, really, that... Self-control. If you have that self-control, man, come on. <laughs> I know that's what marriage is for. It's to, it's to prove that I do or that I don't have. It. That's all it is. That I do or that I don't have patience, you know? That I'm long-suffering or I'm not. Man, I mean, I, I know how to bring it out of my wife. I know how to test it with her. I do. It's for holiness. I believe that. I believe that marriage is for holiness. It's not for happiness. Is that what you thought when you got married? Is that what you thought? 
You realize now how wrong you were? It was not for happiness. It was for holiness. God wants to use your mate to expose what's in you to you so that you can address it. Because if there is no test, you don't know if you pass or fail when it really counts. You need to be tested to see what's in you and to see what you're made of. You need to know. You need to know. He can use your child too. That's right. <laughs> what you said? That's right. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah, your brothers and your sisters, your siblings. People in the church. Hallelujah. All right, so Matthew chapter 7. I don't have the verse. I, I'm just like, I'm, I'm trying to move. I, this is a new thing God's doing in my life. I'm preaching under an hour. Well under an hour these days. It's a new thing God's doing. Hallelujah. But look, Matthew 7. This is a really popular scripture. And this is the one where he talks about how many are going to come to me in that day. He's talking about Judgment Day, right? And he's talking about the ones that were the wicked, the ones that that they don't make it. These are not the ones at the judgment seat of Christ. These are going to be the ones that will be at the great, great white throne judgment. The judgment of the wicked. And they're going to go to him. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Miracles in your name. And then he says, depart from me, you work of So we, we hear that a lot. I know we've been on that quite a bit, you know, over the past, I don't know, several, several months. It's come up here and there. And, and it is powerful. It's, it, really, it really makes you stop. It makes me stop and think, I, I'm still like, Lord, Lord, help us. Lord, help me. But then when you go to Matthew 25, and then you, he talks about the sheep and the goat judgment, the sheep and goats. So then you have both groups. See, that looks like that was just that one group. It was just the goats. But when you go to Matthew 25, you have both groups in there. And first he talks to the sheep. And he tells them what they did. He talks about their works. It sounds to me like he's judging their works. He's saying, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. Enter into that, that into your rest. And then they say, Lord, when? When did we do that? When? He said, when you did it to the very least of these, you did it to me. And then when he goes to the goats, he goes to the ones that they didn't visit when he was sick. They didn't go to see him when he was in prison. They didn't uh, clothe him when he was naked. I just want to make this point, okay? So the first one we read in Matthew 7 was talking about gifts, right? It was more along the lines of gifts. But this one here, I believe, is more focused on fruit. Think about that. Love. I see love in that. I mean, I don't have to have much money to be able to do any of that. I see kindness. I see a lot of God's fruit in that. And I believe that God really, really, really wants us to have gifts. And I believe that he really, really wants us to use those gifts. I also believe that he really, really, really wants to ground us in the fruit so that when we use those gifts, yes. they will be used appropriately. They will be used when he says to do it, when he sends, when he and it will be done for the right motive. Because when we stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, when the righteous, the saints, when they stand before God on judgment day, it's not going to be judged just for what you did. It's going to be judged for why you That's did right. it. Why did you do that? Who were you doing that for? Was that for me? It's supposed to be for me, the head says. It's supposed to be for me. See, in the book of John, he, it says that he gives, the Father give, has given all the judgment to the Son. Yeah. He's given it to Jesus. Jesus is going to be the one to judge the righteous. Jesus is going to be the one to judge the wicked. Yeah. He's going to judge the sheep. He's going to judge the goats. 
And I still, I stick to what I've said in the past. I, I believe it's because it's very personal to him because Jesus took the wrath of God on himself. Yeah. He took it on himself. And I also believe that's why it's called the wrath of the lamb in the very end when he pours it out on the earth. Because again, it's personal to Christ. It, he went, he went to the cross. Yes, yes. He was mocked. He was spat upon. He was tied to the whipping post. <coughs> He took those stripes. He took the whip across his back with all the meat and the flesh being pulled out. He suffered the horror of a crucifixion with two common criminals. And here he was, the king of kings, mm. the son of God. Let me tell you something. When the apostle John, I was talking to Brennan, uh, I think it was today or yesterday. Uh, I was talking to Brennan about it and I was just thinking, man, you know, when John was with Jesus in his earthly ministry, he laid his head on his bosom, the Bible says, laid his head on his chest. They were very close. It was obvious they had a really tight, tight relationship. They were like brothers. But when John in the book of Revelation goes up, he calls him up to come up to heaven and see. He goes up and then the Bible says he falls to the ground as though he's dead. Oh, hallelujah. That was a very different Jesus right there. The lamb is very different from the lion. It's the same person, but I'm talking about the expression as the lion of Judah, as the king of kings yes. is very different. Now, John was in his, in his physical fleshly state. So with a glorified body, that may look really different. But uh, man, I'm telling you... Uh, <laughs> It's going to be something really powerful. Would y'all stand with me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Look, all I want, that's the reason I keep talking about it, is I want unity in the church because I believe that's what God wants. Yeah. I believe that's what he wants more than anything. Thank you. Yvette or Rich? Yeah. Play something. I believe that's what God wants. And... <clears throat> I know for a fact God wants to use this church and this group of people. And, and I know for a fact he wants to use the other churches in the area. And look, whether, whether we think that, you know, we have certain things right and, and maybe others, we think, you know, maybe they don't. But it doesn't matter. They're part of the body of Christ. And we are one yes. with them some way, somehow. And we need to view it yes. that way. We need to look at it that way. And we need to open up ourselves, open up our arms and, and, and welcome yes. the fellowship so that we can we can be connected as the whole body of Christ. Yes. That's the way we're supposed to be, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank God that, uh, that He can change our hearts and our minds and the way that we look at things. And, and I also, I just want to, I want to encourage you that whether you agree with everything that goes on, you know, I mean, wherever you're at, whether you agree with everything that goes on, what is it that God requires from us to keep unity while we're not always agreeing? What is it that God requires? What does he require? We want to please him. We want to do what's right by him. We want to please the head. The head has a certain way and he said it over and over again he wants unity he wants unity he wants us to be one he's fully aware we're a many member body he's fully aware that i'm different from you and you're different from from him or her but he wants us to work together that's what he's called us to do we need intercessors we need prayer warriors we need those who can give a prophetic word in the right time where in due season Someone who could come with a word of exhortation, give a word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Like we need this. This is what God gave to his body, to the ecclesia, the church. Amen. That's what he gave us for that specific purpose. We need people who know how to give, who have the heart and the calling to give and have the ability to do it, to meet the needs of those who cannot even help themselves. That's what it's for. We need those that have the gift to show mercy. We need that gift. We need the gift to teach and the gift to... Um, we need the gift of healing. That's right. Miracles. We need it all. We need it all. We need all of it. If God gave it to us, we need it. We need it all. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I just pray right now, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would just let your word just 
go deep into our hearts, into our spirits, and let it marinate, Lord. Let it just, let it soak. Let your word soak in our minds and in our spirits. anything that we want, Lord, we want to please you, and we want, Lord, to be obedient to you and your word, and I ask God, where it is very difficult at times for me, Lord, I'm asking God that you would, that you would help me, Lord God, to have a heart that is humble, Lord God, a heart that is repentant, Lord God, when the flesh rises up, Lord God, that I will be repentant. Lord, I ask God that you would just pour out your spirit, Lord, in a greater measure, Lord, in a greater way, Lord, that we've never even seen before, Lord. Not just so we can say, wow, that was cool, Lord, but so that souls could be won into the kingdom, so that you could be glorified, so that you could be high and lifted up in us, so that the whole world, the whole neighborhood, the whole city will see that God is alive, that God is powerful, that he has salvation to offer, that he has gifts, the gift of eternal life to give. Lord, we want souls to be won, Lord, when we go knocking on doors, Lord. We want people to hear the right words spoken to them, Lord. We want to pray prayers for healing. We want to pray prayers, Lord God, to see miracles happen. We want, Lord, the gift of faith to be turned loose on people who need that ministry, Lord God, to have faith, Lord God, to believe you for the impossible. We ask God in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you, God. We want to please you. We want to please you. The body should want to please the head. The body should want to be obedient to the head. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, 